democracies are realizing the fact that in order to realize um, 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 uh, freedom of expression um, and the right to communicate, that um, um, the um, excessive concentration needs to be limited in order to promote diversity of, of opinion and that the mon monopolization of opinion by single voices or a few voices um, can present a substantial threat um, to, um, to, to, to the health um, of a democracy. So that's the second area that's been increasingly recognized as an area of legitimate intervention um, for, for, for legislators. Um, and, um, you know, obviously a number of countries have been grappling with um, what I mentioned earlier, which are um, um, anti-concentration measures that would in turn um, place a cap on how large um, the major newspaper groups should grow. A related um, um, issue that legislators are grappling with as well is whether to limit uh, foreign ownership as well. In the interests of um, uh, preserving um, cultural integrity and na national um, diversity of opinion. So that's also an area that legislators are, are certainly um, grappling with. Now obviously as I, as I, as I, as I pointed out earlier, you're not really going to be able to successfully legislate um, the question of how large or you know how large um, uh, is too large yes. for media groups. You're not going to be able to deal with that successfully until you answer the prior question of um, how do you measure diversity. Mm. Um, and um, once you answer that question, then you can start to ask the question: Well, how should media ownership be structured? in order to achieve um, that, um, the levels of, of diversity that you want to have in that, in, in that particular country. Now France is quite an interesting case because they've obviously decided that for democratic reasons um, they are going to place a limit um, on concentration of newspapers. Um, but given that France is, um, and I think you were alluding to this um, um, uh, Honourable Member, um, um, given that France tends to be more, um, if you like, um, linguistically homogenous, mm -hmm. um, um, in a country like South Africa, I think that the case could even be stronger, actually, um, for uh, control of excessive concentration, precisely because um, we live in a linguistically extremely complex um, country, it's been extremely difficult, particularly for um, community newspapers that publish in the marginalised languages, to survive. Um, there's one newspaper, for instance, um, in Pomalanga that up until quite recently has been publishing in Chivenda, uh, Shitsonga, um, uh, and um, Setswana. And they have actually had to discontinue their publication in Chivenda and Shitsonga um, because they just haven't been able to, to afford it. So, you know, publication in marginalized languages um, is, is, is extremely difficult. So I think in view of that, we have an even stronger case to make, potentially, than France for the need to, 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 to limit um, concentration. Um, now, the trends in relation to ownership um, why do we seem to have gone backwards in terms of ownership diversity? Um, I think the reasons are quite complex. Um, a lot of it had to do with the peculiar macroeconomic conditions of the late 1990s with the adoption of the Growth, Employment and Redistribution Plan that led to the cost of credit going up. Um, and given that a lot of empowerment groups, the women's groups and the trade union groups and the black empowerment groups and what have you, tended to be funded by debt rather than equity. Um, it made it extremely difficult for those groups to survive. So I think the macroeconomic environment and what was happening with interest rates and the cost of credit um, had a very um, a serious impact on the ability of those groups to maintain their foothold in the, um, in the ownership um, of the newspaper groups. Hence, we had that reconsolidation taking place in the, in, in the early 2000s. Um, the MDDA and the role of the MDDA, you know, um, 
speaking personally, I was, I was part of the, and I think a number of us were part of the very initial discussions um, around the establishment of the MDDA and were part of the whole process of the establishment of the MDDA and what have you. And one of the things that I think we need to do also as part of this process that's been initiated by Parliament is to have a comprehensive review of the MDDA and the extent to which it's actually impacted on the media development and diversity picture. Because although you know, the MDDA has been reporting on an annual basis um, um, about its, its work, I don't think we necessarily have a full comprehensive understanding of the impact that it's had on the, um, on the media diversity picture since its inception. Um, and I think that's quite critical. I think there's very little doubt in our minds that the MDDA is underfunded. And you know, that's one of the mandates that we're coming with to this hearing. We certainly want to argue for increased funding for the MDDA, but at the same time, we also need to evaluate what the MDDA is been doing and whether how the, the MDDA is conceptualized is actually up to the task, if you like, of realizing um, media diversity. Because um, just to reiterate a point that I made earlier that if you're just simply going to subsidize while leaving the fundamental market structure intact, mm -hmm. you're not doing enough. You're not doing enough because you're just plowing money into a situation where the structural conditions that disadvantage small commercial and community media remain. And funding alone and limited grants at that are not necessarily going to address those particular structural problems. And it's the structural problems, I think, that we need to pinpoint, we need to identify them and understand exactly how to deal with them. Um, so can they do, do more? Um, I think the fact that the MDDA, I think in 2009, if I'm not mistaken, initiated this um, uh, research project in order to understand you know, the extent to which um, the media have transformed, I think is, is very welcome. But you know, frankly, we shouldn't be at this stage now where we're grappling to answer the question to what extent have the media transformed. We should have a, we should have a clear answer. And I think that you know, the MDDA also needs to play an advocacy role as well in, in helping us to understand where we are as a country with respect to the transformation of media and what needs to be done in order to ensure that the media becomes more transformed um, than where we are at the moment. And um, I've still got to get that, um, that, I've still got to see the MDDA playing that kind of strong advocacy role in relation to um, in relation to media diversity, and admittedly, its mandate is limited, and perhaps its mandate needs to be revisited in order to ensure that it plays um, a stronger a stronger role. Um, push by the bigger media groups to take over the small media, um, that's certainly something um, that, we've, that we've picked up on, um, particularly in the, in the outlying areas, um, and that's certainly a concern for us. What are we doing about it? Well, we're attempting to understand the extent of the problem. Um, we have been speaking you know, directly, for instance, to ARP members in order to understand how badly affected they are. Um, what are the problems that, um, that make the competitive environment so difficult? And so we're at that stage at the moment um, of attempting to understand the problem. Also the Right to Know campaign, because it's a popular campaign, have been um, signing up community media groups as members um, and will obviously continue to do that. Um, do we consider ourselves to be the, the voice? Um, of these small community newspapers. Well, um, they already have one voice, which is the Association for Independent Newspapers. But certainly to the extent that um, uh, these, these newspapers are struggling to survive, and to the extent that has, that has an impact on the free flow of information in the country, which in turn impacts negatively on the right to know, um, certainly their problems need to be our problems and we need to take them on board.
um, the Honourable Member asked the question about how would we have liked to see um, this in Darba being convened. Well, we certainly would have liked more time um, in order to prepare. Um, it's just more of a happy coincidence than anything else that there was this book chapter that, that, that we could draw on. Um, but um, in order to really do a question like this justice, we would have liked um, to have the space to be able to do precisely the kind of research that uh, Honourable Kenyon is alluding to um, about what measures have been implemented by other countries and how well have they worked in order to realise diversity. You know, these kinds of questions can't be rushed. To an extent, they're also new questions um, for South Africa as well. Um, so we, we, we certainly needed um, a lot more time um, to prepare. Um, we would have loved um, as many um, uh, community groups to, uh, to, to have been um, involved um, as possible. Um, so the very small um, community um, and, and commercial newspapers that we've been speaking about, um, there are a number of groups here that will be presenting, but um, if they had had an opportunity I think to be able to prepare themselves to come and speak directly about their own experiences, I think that that would have been quite illuminating um, actually for the committee because then you could hear about the practical problems with um, attempting to stay in the market um, that have been experienced by people on the ground. Perhaps that's something that the committee can consider doing in future um, so that you can hear directly from the, from the horse's mouth if you could put it like that. Um, 